Hi, this is Dr. Tanya Brown. I'm a pediatric neuropsychologist and assistant professor of psychology at Mayo Clinic, and I'm here with Dr. Sherry Wade, who's a professor, research professor at Cincinnati Children's Hospital uh, in Cincinnati, Ohio. And she uh, and I have worked for quite a bit of time on research in pediatric and adolescent TBI and behavioral interventions for children. And we're here at the American Academy of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation in Orlando, Florida. Thank you for joining me today and allowing me to ask you some questions about uh, relevant topics in our field. Um, first, I'd like to ask you if you are um, noticing an increased incidence of pediatric traumatic brain injury in your institution. I think the incidence of TBI really depends on the age range. In younger kids, I think we've seen a decreasing incidence due to some of the um, better um, child restraints, changes in child restraint laws so that children have to be uh, in child safety seats for a longer period of time. Some of the other um, protective campaigns I think have really made a difference. I think um, for sports concussion, obviously there's an increased awareness, so I don't know that there's a really changing incidence, but I think more people are seeking treatment for it given the, the increased public awareness about uh, the possible long-term consequences of concussion. Makes sense. You, we, we, most of our research has been on children with either severe or moderate brain injuries, and um, we briefly mentioned the concussion <clears throat> kind of population. Do you think, so, and we've worked on problem solving and behavior management and those kinds of um, kinds of issues in teaching and parent training and that kind of thing with our population. Do you think at some point it would make sense to branch out into those concussion population or do you think there's just not enough need for some well, of Well, that's actually something that I've been working on right now. Um, Lynn Babcock, who's an emergency room physician at Cincinnati Children's, uh, she and I are preparing an in-house proposal. We also submitted a proposal to uh, NFL charities to develop a, a web-based intervention that would focus on both symptom monitoring and also um, some cognitive behavioral coping strategies for kids with concussion. I think one of the challenges with concussion is that now they're prescribing cognitive rest. And what that means and the duration is very unclear. And so some kids are actually in bed for weeks after their concussion and then they have secondary problems. I mean, if you miss weeks of school as an adolescent, you're kind of in a bad position. Um, so I, I, that's definitely a direction that we're moving in right now. And if you want to move in that direction with us, that would be great. Well, that's exactly what we're seeing and having issues with as well, is the kind of that cognitive or brain rest and how long does that go on and, um, and when do we get kids back into school and, and, and it's hard for me and a clinical end to make recommendations really without having the children back in school knowing what deficits are there, if any. So I agree it's an area of concern. Um, what other clinical initiatives do you have going on right now at Cincinnati Children's? Well, I think clinically we have um, a new TBI clinic that um, Brad Karowski is heading up that's going to uh, be a multidisciplinary clinic and kind of bridge the spectrum from mild TBI concussion to severe TBI uh, so that people aren't followed in so many places. And so that's sort of our new clinical initiative. On the research side, uh, we've got work at a variety of different levels. Um, so, you know, there are certainly the, the web-based um, treatment studies that we're doing. And as part of the, pediat the Center for Pediatric Traumatic Brain Injury Interventions, that's supported by the National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research. Uh, we're conducting several multi-site clinical trials looking at the teen online problem solving program, um, the internet interacting together every day, um, parenting skills program, and also uh, an attention management program that uh, was developed by McKay Moore Solberg at uh, the University of Washington. And we're actually doing a pilot of that study right now, doing functional imaging pre- and post-treatment to see if the intervention, one, re results in significant attentional changes, and if those attentional changes correspond to neural changes um, in the brain. Because that's one of the, the theories of attention training is that it 
results in neural remodeling, and a lot of neuropsychologists are very skeptical about that. <laughs> but, but so this will give us an opportunity to at least collect some pilot data and then pursue that in a larger study. Very exciting. Mentioned the web-based studies, and we were chatting briefly about um, being able to make our our um, services and the web-based interventions more available to families. What do you think should be our next step in really um, branching out clinically, if we can, um, and and allowing other fam the families to receive the internet-based services that we can provide them? I think that's a really important question, and I think. Um, it's a challenge bridging that gulf between clinical work and research and so these research developed paradigms often don't find their way into clinical work unless there's a big rollout so you know in the department of defense they've rolled out cognitive therapies cognitive processing therapy for post-traumatic stress disorder um, but short of that it's really hard to get a bunch of people to change practice I sometimes think I would do better selling it because if I was selling it, people would want to buy it. And the fact that we've been kind of giving it away means people want to use it, but they don't really have a framework for using it. Um, and so I think I, I don't really have the answer to that question, but I think some of it has to do with um, breaking down some of the boundaries between state um, psychology organizations because this obviously involves practicing across state lines and different people who do telehealth have circumvented some of those regs in different ways but I think that there needs to be a consistent policy from the top down sort of at, at the American Psychological Association level for psychologists. Um, there are other people who are doing telerehabilitation who are working on those kinds of things um, so there's a lot of different agencies and organizations that are kind of working on it, but uh, maybe even a, a health and human services initiative that says, you know, if we want to cut health care costs, this is one way to do it. Makes sense. Thank you so much for joining me today, and it's been fun to work with you certainly across the years, and we'll continue working together in the future.